Often when developers think of blocks, they think of the header followed by a bunch of data representing transactions. Usually that works fine, but it's not quite accurate. And occasionally it can result in some subtle unconscious assumptions that might make things more difficult than they need to be. In reality, blocks in this format are only ever used in two places, over the network when a node is doing their initial synchronization and in storing the blocks to the disk. But neither of these are part of the consensus itself, and an implementation of Bitcoin could very well use a completely different format if desired without necessarily breaking compatibility with the rest of the community. So what actually constitutes a block? Each block is identified by a single cryptographic hash. That hash commits to various abstract information. No matter how the block is stored or transmitted over the network, to verify the block, one must compute the correct hash. Therefore, the block itself is comprised of the information required for computing the correct hash independently of what format the information is stored in. So information is needed to compute the block hash. First, we have the block version, which is actually a can of worms. But let's not get into that now. Um, we also have the timestamp, the difficulty, and an arbitrary 32 bits called the nonce. These simple fields are called the block header and are committed to simply by adding them into SHA-256 hash in a well-defined manner. But the block hash also commits to more information using two more complicated algorithms called the blockchain and the Merkle tree which provide extra functionality not relevant to the topic. Despite the additional complexity in mid-calculation hashes, at the end of the day, these are both still just committing to information. This extends to the transactions as well. One is tempted to just see a transaction as a sequence of formatted bytes indicating a transfer. But in reality, the transaction can be represented any way that an implementer likes, so long as the commitment is correctly calculated when it is mined into a block. There are also two additional commitments needed for transactions. The transaction ID, which must be calculated when spending an output created for, by such a transaction, and the signatures, which are calculated using an asymmetric digital signature to prove the transaction has permission to consume its inputs. So these similarly are commitments to the abstract information making up the transaction. Since the serialization of transactions and blocks is not relevant to the consensus system itself, let's disregard it and use JSON instead to look at them. A nice property of looking at this in JSON is that it becomes obvious that we can add new keys without disrupting anything. For example, we could add a memo field. Since the block does not commit to this memo field, however, it does not need to be processed by other nodes to validate the block. That makes sense since other nodes really don't care about the memo in the first place. But if your accounting party cares about the memo, you can still send it to them using any common network protocol like this. However, what if you want to use this field in new rules? For example, let's look at SegBit. The infamous problem with unintended malleability was a result of the transaction ID committing to more information than the digital signature. Specifically, the transaction ID committed to the signature field, while the signature obviously could not commit to itself. The solution was to add a new field called the witness and move the signature there while requiring the old signature field to be empty. By requiring the old field to be empty, it is effectively deleted as its commitment becomes a constant. So now we have replaced the signature field with a new witness field. Um, none of the block, the transaction, nor the signature commit to this new field, so it looks like the memo field. It can be ignored by other nodes. But with the soft fork, we can add a consensus rule that the block is only valid if the witness fields verify correctly. New nodes must receive and validate the witness field even without any commitment to it.
Unfortunately, without a commitment to new information, an attacker can use a valid block hash to trigger the more CPU time-consuming signature validations for a block to, that is invalid, because the final witness hash fails due to its corruption. So to avoid these denial-of-service attacks, we need to have the block hash commit to any field used for validation. Since existing nodes already calculate the block's commitment in a specific way that does not include the new witness field, we need to extend to the current commitment algorithm somehow. How can we do this? By reusing an arbitrary 256-bit piece of information already committed to, to commit to a new commitment hash instead. Transaction outputs, including as part of the block reward, each have scripts determining the conditions under which it can be spent. These outputs are also allowed to have a value of zero bitcoins. For SegWit, we chose to increment the output count and commit to the new information in a Merkle tree as if it were 256 bits of output script data. Now all nodes can be told about this fake output so that they can calculate the correct block hash, whereas new nodes can implement the revised commitment algorithm. As a result, we have cleanly replaced the signature field with a new witness field without breaking backwards compatibility or even without any ugly hacks. Now going back to the distinction between the abstract information and serialization thereof. Years ago, the infamous block size limit was introduced. This was, in fact, the first and only consensus rule that dealt directly with the disk serialization of the block headers and new transactions. A lot of discussion can be found about what this block size limit should or shouldn't be, but the real question that should have been asked is why such a concept existed in the first place. Disk space has never been a particularly limiting factor of nodes. Bandwidth has, but it is only one of many factors. Arguably, the most expensive factor is the unspent transaction output set, which needs to be accessed to process any new blocks. But it's not related to block sizes at all. Therefore, while clearly there must be some resource limit, it doesn't really make sense to have it based on the network serialization bytes. One particularly harmful shortcoming of this limit is the difference in byte sizes between the signatures and public keys. For Bitcoin, the typical size of a public key script, including when creating a new UTXO entry, is approximately one-fourth of the size of the typical signature needed to remove that entry later. That means that it is effectively costing four times more to reduce the burden of the UTXO set than it did to increase the burden. Pretty big conflict between the burden of the system and the usage incentives. Due to the way SegWit moved the signatures out of the existing block commitment into a new commitment, old nodes will no longer see the signatures nor count the size toward the block size limit. This created an opportunity to rebalance the limit to match the actual burdens on the network. It therefore replaced with the byte limit, it replaced the byte limit with an abstract weight limit. The weight limit is four times larger and data serialized for old nodes would count toward this new limit as four weight units per byte, thus avoiding violating their enforced size limit. But instead of counting signatures at the same weight, since the witness field is new, we can count it as a low weight. Existing fields, on the other hand, can only be counted at a greater relative weight in a soft fork. And so now you can see the um, the key weighing four times as much as the byte size. It weighs approximately the same as the signature that is needed to spend it and to reduce the UTXO set. Any questions? Uh, I have a question then. Um, yesterday we talked a lot about like snore signatures. Is it is this how is it's going to be uh, applied inside like Bitcoin because essentially that is a different signature scheme than what Bitcoin protocol currently supports, right? It has a lot of different attributes. I'm not sure if there's really any um, 
consensus yet on what the actual implementation is going to look like for actually embedding it into the transactions. Any other questions? Describe what, what is in SpoonNet. I don't actually remember what SpoonNet was. <laughs> it doesn't actually remember. <laughs> that was your hard fork. It was your hard fork? Is it a hard fork generator? No. The no. soft hard fork idea concept? <laughs> that was the soft hard fork idea? Yeah. Completely. Can you explain a little bit more about it? It would probably be a whole different presentation on its own. <laughs> Not a quick five second explanation. It's essentially making a hard fork that old nodes continue to follow the blocks with the block hash, even though they don't see the new block at all. Um, I'm not sure how well it relates to this. <laughs> Any other different questions? All right, thank you very much, Luke. Thank you.